Hey, everyone. First and foremost, I want to thank you all for your support during the past week and a half. It has been a heck of a ride, and I sincerely appreciate you. I'm going to do a more personal stream, hopefully within the next week, to show you a little bit of what is going on down here in the armpit of the universe, as well as thank some of you that reached out and helped and do some giveaways and some fun stuff because we need a little light in our lives lately. But this one isn't light. This one is heavy, very heavy. We are headed to the great state of Kansas to meet Mr. Kaplan. Mr. Kaplan was previously dating a woman named Melissa. Melissa, unfortunately, had a stroke. We have seen this happen all too often. This stroke incapacitated her and caused her a lot of health issues and resulted in her being placed in a adult care facility. Some people would call that a nursing home. There's all different names for it. They perform the same functions no matter what you call them. Some of you may or may not know, but in order for any government financial assistance healthcare program to cover a residential facility, nursing home, adult care, anything, child care even, the person going in must have exhausted their personal assets first. I guess the thought being that you don't need a house, a car, or anything else when you can't take care of yourself and you need somebody else to take care of you. I'm not really sure. I know this from personal experience with family. You have to sell everything you own, use your own personal funds to pay for this care. And when you run out of money and you're absolutely broke, then the government will step in and help you. That's what is happening in this case. When Melissa had her stroke, she owned a home. Mr. Camp Camplin, Camplin, C-A-M-P-L-I-N, Camplin, there's no H, lived in the home with her apparently. And when he was notified of all of this, he was made her, they'll, they'll go over it in more detail, but he was made her power of attorney and he was in the home with her and he refused to leave. He also refused to pay the facility who is now owed over $100,000. So he was charged criminally with mistreatment of a dependent adult or an elder person, which is a level five person felony. And the state alleges that between December of 23 and June of 24 in Butler County, that Mr. Camplin did knowingly take the personal property or financial resources of Miss Melissa by refusing to pay the bill at the life care center of over $100,000 and taking an additional $46,000 in cash from her bank account for the benefit of himself or another person by taking control, title, use, or management of the personal property or financial resources of a dependent adult or elder person through undue influence, coercion, harassment, duress, deception, false representation, false pretense, or without adequate consideration to such dependent adult or elder person, and the aggregate value of the personal property or finances is at least $25,000, but less than $100,000, in violation of KSA 21-5417. So... He has been um, a little bit difficult up until this point. So I have a feeling things are going to get interesting. So let's go to court. <laughs> Next. The third. 24 CR 316. Warren William Kaplan the third. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Kaplan. Hello, my honor. Mr. Kaplan, you were yes. charged by way of information on or about December 22nd, 2023 through June 28, 2024 in Butler County, Kansas with mistreatment of a dependent adult or an elder person, a level five person felony. The allegation is you refuse to pay the bill at a life care center over $100,000 and taking over $46,000 in cash from the dependent's bank account. That's what you're charged with. Do you understand the charge? Yes, I do. You do have the right to counsel if you cannot afford an attorney. One would be appointed to represent you. 
And Mr. Kaplan, do you have any money in savings to hire an attorney? No. Um, are you currently employed? No. What, is your, what is your source of income? Disability. Well, Social Security. It, they changed it from disability to Social Security for some reason. Okay. Uh, based on information provided this day, Indeed. court finds you do not have financial wherewithal for retaining an attorney. Therefore, the court does appoint Jim Watts to represent you at all stages of the proceedings. Jim Watts is appointed to represent you at all stages of the proceedings. Court sets your next appearance date Indeed. on the felony preliminary hearing control docket before Chief Judge Ricky, and that would be on Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024 at 2.30. Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024 at 2.30 before Chief Judge Ricky for felony preliminary hearing control docket. Uh, the ne next item of business is the court to make inquiry. Mr. Uh, Kaplan uh, was summoned in today. Recommendation for bond, Mr. Regeer. Your Honor, as observed by the court, I am showing a summons was filed with the court earlier this month for an appearance of today's date and time, July 29th, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. Notwithstanding the charge and the alternative charge presently before the court, which the state does consider quite serious, the state is prepared to proceed with a 35,000 OR bond with all conditions with special emphasis on no contact with the victim or any endorsed witnesses. Besides the amounts um, alleged in count one of the information of 100,000 and over 46,000 in cash, this is a case where um, pursuant to um, paragraphs two, three, and four of the affidavit, um, wh which would appear to refer to a, um, a dating relationship between the defendant and the victim, paragraph three does appear to refer to multiple financial instruments being written over the course of approximately one amounts in amount ranging in amounts ranging for one thousand to fifteen thousand, as well as multi, as well as in paragraph four, multiple financial instruments being written by the defendant to himself. Additionally, this is a defendant with a history of quite significant um, convictions, as, as the state understands it. Besides misdemeanor theft, um, multiple aggravated person felonies. Thank you, Mr. Regeer. It does appear appropriate for the court to order a substantial bond herein. Court does adopt the recommendation and does order a $35,000 OR bond. $35,000 on your own recognizance bond, Mr. Camp. Do you have any question about that? Yes, Your Honor. And please proceed. I want to request a jury trial. I have a lot of witnesses to call. I have proof of abuse by and where Melissa is now and or where she is now. Beep, beep. And I have done nothing but been taking care of Melissa Morton and keeping my word to her. I'm taking care of her animals, all of them, and everything that belonged to her and me <laughs> are in the storage unit. Mr. And Kaplan, I let me interrupt you for just a moment. I think that the best hmm. advice and the court is limited in the advice I can give you. I understand. It would be that you would not proceed uh, with, with dialogue, that you okay. confer with your terms. Okay. I understand. Okay. But I second, $5,000 on your own recognizance bond. So right. you're able to sign your own bond. How do I do that? I'll get the information, Johnny. He needs to be processed. At the jail? Yes. And a uh, particular date and time? Um, we could do it Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Would Wednesday at 2 o'clock work? What's yes. the process mean? What? 
me being processed, I have to go get processed. What, how long does that take? And it takes about 15 minutes. It's just fingerprints and pictures. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm saying is because I have, I'm taking care of animals right now and uh, lots going on. Does yeah. that time work in day Wednesday at two o'clock? Yes. If it's not, please. No, go it works. Sheriff's Department in El Dorado. Okay, this I know what county. Is. This is a county matter, not city of Andover matter. So you need well, to come to the county jail, which okay. is located directly east of the city of El Dorado on Highway 54, and it's on Stone Road, Stone Road, Butler County Jail for processing this Wednesday. July 24 at 2 o'clock. July 31. July 31. July 31, 2024 at 2 o'clock. July 31, 2024 at 2 o'clock. 31st of July at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock. Okay. Okay. And your next appearance is before. September 3rd, 2024, at 2.30. That's a Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024, at 2.30. And Mr. Watts has been appointed to represent you in the case. Mr. Watts. Anything further, Mr. Kaplan? Yes. I can't find my pen. I had one with me, but I can't find it. Uh, well, why don't you go find a pen and a piece of A pencil. Okay, I'm looking right now. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Excuse me, Your Honor. Ow. Ah. It may take me a minute. I have to stand up. Hang on. Beep. All right, I have a pen. It just was a minute away. I know five times. Uh, July, July thirty first. July. At, what time Wednesday, was that again? Wednesday, July thirty first, at two o'clock. For Honestly. booking and processing. Booking and processing. Okay. Yeah, at the Butler County Jail. Okay. What else do you need? The second one you were talking Monday. Excuse me. It's not a Monday. It is not a Monday. It is okay. a Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024, at 2.30 before Chief Judge Ricky. Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024, at 2.30 before Chief Judge Ricky. That will be by Zoom at that time. And will will I be able to get a, a ID and password for that? Judge, yeah. their um, security is contacting me. They're wanting me to put him in a breakout room with them. Okay. And they can help him. We'll go into a breakout room with you, Mr. Kaplan, so that Security can go over all your questions in more detail as you may have. I don't understand the breakout. Okay, Mr. Kaplan, ju just a moment, okay, sir? Let me get this. This is uh, in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled State of Kansas versus Warren William Kaplan III. Case number 2024-CR-316, Amber Norris appearing for the state, James Watts' defense counsel, Mr. Kamplin in the office of his lawyer, his lawyer, all by Zoom. 
What announcement is made regarding preliminary hearing right in this case? Mr. Your Honor, we'd ask the case be scheduled for preliminary hearing, please. Wednesday, October 2 at 11 o'clock a.m. I'm going the wrong way. Hang on. October 2 at 11? Yes. Uh, assuming, Your Honor, that I am not in, uh, I'm in front of Judge Crum that morning on a case that's going to take quite a while. It's scheduled till noon on a preliminary hearing, and it will probably take that long. All right. So you'll open up in the afternoon then? I, can, I should be open in the afternoon. I also tell you I'm on the misdemeanor jury trial docket that day, although that's likely to fall off. Okay. I'll set uh, Camplin for Wednesday, October 2 at 1 o'clock. Yes, sir. Your Honor, could we go at like 2 o'clock instead? Okay. I trust there's a good reason for that. Uh, yes, Your Honor. If we could do the 2 o'clock slot, that would be better for my calendar. All right. Camplin is now set for 2 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, October 2nd. October 2 at 2. Camplin, you'll need to appear in the office of your attorney, Mr. Watts, just like you did today. All right. Okay, so evidentiary hearing in the case set for Wednesday, October 2nd, 2 o'clock p.m. That is a one-hour setting. Anything else we need to address on Camplin, Ms. Norris? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Watts? No, sir. Thank you. Camplin matters in recess. We'll move on to another matter. Um, I'll appoint a different attorney. If you don't want me, that will probably end up. All right. Uh, I'm going to announce at this time State of Kansas versus okay, Warren ahead. William Camplin III. Case number 2024 CR 316. James Watts appears as counsel for defendant. Defendant appears in the office of his attorney by Zoom. Amber Norris appears for the state. Uh, back on September the 3rd, this matter came before the court. The defendant requested an evidentiary hearing. The evidentiary hearing was set for today at 2 o'clock. I trust the state's ready to proceed. Yes, Your Honor. And I trust the defendant is ready to proceed, Mr. Watts. It would be, Your Honor. My client and I have been discussing it. it my client has been debating. I think maybe has to be undecided as to whether or not he wishes to request dis different counsel. Um, I have had probably two to two and a half hours of discussion with my client over uh, a couple of days. Um, put it bluntly, sir, we have, Your Honor, we have, um, he has some views on how this court he would like to proceed that I do not believe are supported under the law. We have very different approaches to it as a result, and my client may wish to, to ask the court for a different attorney. Mr. Camplin, is there something that you wish to state to the court? Sir. I don't know if I can get it. Um, so I'm not sure what I can say and what I can't say. I don't know. Are you making some sort of request to the court at this time, Mr. Kaplan? We're, we're ready to start an evidentiary hearing to see if probable cause exists to keep this case going or not. That's our purpose today. No, the attorney has shown me that there is their probable cause. But I'm not getting anywhere with my side of the story on it. And I don't believe I'm going to be able to. Well, this hearing is for purposes of the state to show their evidence to prove that there is probable cause to keep this case going. This isn't the trial of the case, Mr. Camplin. Isn't it what? This is not the trial of the case. Your guilt or innocence will not be decided today, but only if there's probable cause that a felony crime has been committed and that you committed it. That's the purpose of this hearing. I understand. That's been pointed out to me, Your Honor. 
Okay, so is there a reason why we shouldn't go forward with this today, then, Mr. Campbell? Need more time because I'm not getting anywhere past the paperwork that I signed. So I can't get past that. I, that's where I'm stuck. I can't go back. I can't go forward. I'm stuck there. And I feel like uh, that I'm being uh, there's a reason for anything or everything. And, uh, this was not I don't want you to get too far into the facts of your case, Mr. Camplin. I understand. That's the state's obligation to put on evidence today to show what this case is about. You're not actually required to do anything. Um, All I can say then, if you just want me to say something, I'll just say that uh, certain things led up to this case that we're in right now. All right. So noted. Um, to the extent that there was perhaps a suggestion of a request for a continuance, that request would be denied. We're going to go forward today, and the court is going to determine if there's probable cause to keep this case going or not. As nor as you have the obligation, of course, of going forward with evidence to show probable cause in this case, you may call your first witness. Okay. Your Honor, the state calls um, Brandon Johnson. Okay. Uh, and where is Brandon Johnson on the screen? I'm here. Uh, all right. Very well. Mr. Johnson, if you raise your right hand again, I, I'll administer an oath to you. Johnson. Okay. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes. All right. You may question the witness, Ms. Norris. Your Honor, would ask witnesses be sequestered, please. Any other witnesses subpoenaed by the state to testify, they'll need to wait in a waiting room until they're called in and actually uh, for purposes of giving their testimony. So, Mandy, if you'd put, uh, I guess, Lieutenant Scheinert and the DCF representative into waiting rooms. All right, you may proceed, Ms. Norris. Please state your name and occupation for the record. Yes, Brandon Johnson, Executive Director of Life Care Center of Andover. And uh, Mr. Johnson, how uh, long have you been um, at Andover Life Care? Since August of 23. And what are your duties there at Andover Life Care? Yeah, I um, manage the en entire operation of the um, skilled nursing facility and ensure that we're in compliance with regulations, as well as ensuring that um, we have each department functioning appropriately to take care and serve residents. Okay. And are you familiar, uh, and, and prior to uh, going to Andover Life Care, uh, were you in the healthcare industry? That is correct. I've um, been executive director at Life Care Center Burlington previously. And uh, would you also be considered uh, the records custodian for your facility? I would I would also oversee oversee that as well. Okay. And um, are you familiar with uh, Melissa Ann Morton? Yes. And why are you familiar with, with her? She is a resident at Life Care Center of Andover. And I've been involved with trying to get her approved for Medicaid um, services so that her so that she would be able to pay for her stay at our facility. Okay. And uh, what what is the the status of her um, 
account at, at this juncture with uh, your facility? And how long has she been in your facility as well? Yeah, so our initial admission date was 9-21-2020. Uh, she then had an additional uh, a comeback date where she had uh, admitted back into the facility on uh, March 8th of 2022. And currently, uh, her balance... Okay. Well, that... My apologies. My apologies for the delay I had here. And her her balance stands currently at one hundred and forty three thousand two hundred and thirty six dollars and seventy four cents. As she's been um, denied from Medicaid services, and so the balance has now fallen onto her um, due to her denial. And, uh, what period of time does that balance cover? So that balance, that balance began. Let me get right back to that. That balance goes back to ten twelve of two thousand twenty three. And that does that have to do with the the Medicaid approval or with her de with her denial? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what was the course of action uh, once you found out that Medicaid had denied? Yeah. So we we reached out uh, to Mr. Camplin. Um, I personally reached out as well, and we had a phone um, conversation over the phone that we needed to be able to. Um, to get the home to sell in order for her, in order for her to get approved. Um, that was the conversation. He was living in, he was living in the home um, and then refused to move. Um, we have that refusal um, documented on 1114 of 23 uh, of the statement that he would, he would refuse to move. We ran into a dilemma. Um, we would naturally issue a 30 day discharge um, for her to, be discharged to home for, for him to take care of her. Um, unfortunately, uh, we knew that it would be an unethical decision to discharge her knowing that he would not be able to care for her and perform those services. And so we could not safely discharge her back home. Um, so I was unable to issue that 30 day discharge. And so our only course of action would be to continue to try to work with him to uh, act in her best interest as he agreed to do. Okay. And um, so uh, did you ever have any meetings with Mr. Camplin in person or via Zoom or, or or just was it over the phone and by letter email? Only by phone. And then when we had sent um, certified mail, um, he refused to, to accept it. And so um, it was delivered to him, but he refused to open it or re refused to accept it. Um, Although although it was sent and he did have it because then they gave us the conversation that he was not he would he would not accept the mail. Okay, so um, and uh, this information had to do with she had been de denied Medicaid and that for her to basically be able to maintain in your facility, her home would need to be sold. That's basically where we're at. That is correct. Okay. And so as of December of 2023, uh, was that still the same situation and, and to this date? That is correct. Okay. So her bill keeps occurring. Um, no, no one is paying the bill and uh, you do not have the, do you know whether or not the house has been sold? Yes, the home has been sold and we received um, record that the home was sold from the company that he sold the home to. And that was disclosed to us from the company that sold him the home due to their concern 
of of why because obviously they, they saw the paperwork his his power of attorney paperwork for him to get the home sold and then when he reached out to them about another loan of some sort that is when it triggered a red flag in their mind as to shouldn't you be you know why are you trying to spend her money i you know shouldn't you be you didn't, I, i'm assuming he had the conversation with them about the facility and things of that nature and they were concerned as to why he would want to spend the money to purchase another home instead of taking care of her. And that's what then created the um, the concern they then reported. And we were able to obtain obtain the copy that that uh, indeed the home was sold. OK. And um, what sort of condition is um, Ms. Morton in? I mean, why is why is she in uh, your facility? Yes. So um, currently today, Ms. Morton is totally dependent on CARES. She is unable to stand, walk. Um, she has she's contractured um, upper body and lower body. So she has no ability to um, to legitimately care for herself. She has um, schizoaffective disorder. Uh, she has cerebral infarction. Uh, delusional disorder, as well as, again, just um, the muscle weakness. She is, you know, de totally dependent. She has contractions even to her ankles. And so her ability to care for herself and then also not being in her, um, she also has delirium. So she she's not in her right mind to, to make her own decisions appropriately, as well as to even care for herself. That's why she's in the facility. Um, is she verbal? not not coherently she can't she um she will repeat what's what's often said so if she if somebody if she's in the hallway let's say she's in the dining room and someone says hello or someone's name she may continuously repeat that that particular statement for the next maybe few minutes and so uh, she is not um she's not oftentimes independently communicating so if you um, ask her questions, uh, she's probably not able to answer? No. Okay, so she is completely dependent. And how long has she been in this state? That would be, uh, she has been in this state since 2020. Nine of two thousand twenty-one. Um, nine one nine twenty-one of two thousand twenty. Okay. You disagree with that? And you had mentioned earlier that she actually went out of the facility and then came back in. Was that to basically just go to a different medical facility? I would have to look a little further um, to confirm exactly, um, but I don't have that exact uh, information at this moment. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, permission to share screen? What are you attempting to share, Counsel? Uh, Your Honor, it's a documentation that uh, the defendant signed um, at time of admission in September of 2020, uh, regarding uh, responsibilities and 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 uh, paying responsibilities, you may share the screen at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, um, Ms. Johnson, can you see uh, the, basically as Life Care Centers of America on the upper right corner yes, document? I can. Okay, and uh, as I, I'll scroll down, do you recognize this form? I do. And... 
Uh, this particular form, uh, it appears is, is signed on September 20th of 20. Um, and is this in regards to uh, Miss Morton? That is correct. That document would be um, for her to receive Medicaid services and would is basically requesting assistance to receive to for her to get Medicaid assistance. Okay, so this is basically, um, uh, and then the the signature on this. Uh, can you read that to the court? Yes, Warren Camplin. Okay, and uh, this is basically asking for kind of for your facility to help work on getting her Medicaid. Is that what this form is is meaning? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, move for admission of uh, states one. Any objection by the defense? No, Your Honor. The exhibit will be admitted into evidence. And um, is um, if you if you're, you can still see the screen, this one says Life Care Center of Andover Payment Policy. Is that the same form or a separate page uh, or a completely different form? It's the same form, just a different page. Okay. Okay. So maybe this would be the first page. And what I just showed was the second page. I believe so. It would be within that same category of payments. Okay. And so you, you recognize this, this page as well, this form. That is correct. And this one's for Miss Morton. And this number up here at the top, is that her Okay, that's her a, a number you give to the residents at your facility. That is correct. Okay. And signed, let's see, again on the same date, September 24, 20. That's correct. And um, this one's uh signed by whom? Warren Camplin. Okay, and so um, if you could summarize um, this these this form, um... absolutely. So th this form is is basically the agreement that. Um, if you are a private pay or you have an obligation of payment that you would make that payment before the first of the month or no later than the fifth of the month and and just document informing you as to when we would send out statements and how you can set up a trust fund, how you can pay for things such as the beauty shop and, and, and such forth. Okay. We're going to move for mission of states B. Sorry, Any objection to B? Two. No, Your Honor. Exhibit B will be admitted into evidence. And Your Honor, I misspoke. I would we would ask that the court designate this as Exhibit Two. I'm not sure where the the B came from. <laughs> Very well, then it will be uh, admitted as Exhibit Two. Thank you. And. Uh, As part of uh, the regular kind of course of business, um, does your um, office keep track of of visitors or you know things that come into the facility, uh, like like personal items or medication for each individual um, resident? Yes. Now, the, the, we don't, um, specifically for when people are visiting within the facility, um, we don't have a specific log that a family or someone has to sign in to, to come and visit. But someone that's in Miss um, Morton's state, would you know if they had visitors? 
That is correct. Yes, due to the 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 staff on the halls that they wouldn't they would know. Okay, and uh, was Mr. Camplin uh, in the you know in the last year or so a regular visitor there of Miss Morton's? That is correct. He would come generally in the evenings um, or or the weekends, but not um, generally not not when not not during business hours generally. Okay, so he was coming to see her in the facility. Yes, but not responding. Uh, I mean, did he respond to the letters or the or the phone calls regarding the the billing and the the back back the past due amounts? No, those were not addressed. And Your Honor, I'd ask to share screen again. Uh, this is for a power of attorney. You may do so. Now, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, do you recognize uh, this document? I do. And it's uh, multi-page, um, but why do you recognize it? Because this document is is what allows uh, Mr. Camplin to make financial decisions on behalf of on behalf of Ms. Melissa Morton. Okay, and what date was this signed? May 14th of 2022. And so it appears that Ms. Morton was at least cognizant enough to sign said document and then also to, to make her mark. That is correct. I mean, I, it's I, a signature of sorts. Of some sort, yeah. And uh, who is the uh, designated power of attorney? Warren Camplin. Your Honor, move for admission of the uh, State's Exhibit 3, the power of attorney. Any objection by the defense? Mr. Watts. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Um, great, I want to make great. sure I'm clear. I'm sorry. All right, all right, just a minute. I was just asking whether you're uh, objecting, uh, objecting to Exhibit 3. No objection, Your Honor. I was inquiring right, well. my client about that exhibit. Exhibit 3, the power of attorney document, is admitted into evidence. And Your Honor, I would just note for the record that that is a that is a four page document uh, from uh, start to finish, just for clarification. So noted. And uh, Mr. Johnson, what's the status of of uh, Miss Morton's? Uh, you already noted that Miss Morton's account is uh, over one hundred forty three thousand dollars of unpaid. Uh, I guess room and ward medications, et cetera. Um, has she been approved for Medicaid at this point? She is not. She is, um, she is denied and at this time um, will currently remain denied due to the fact that she has a, she, her home was sold and she has not paid uh, what Medicaid would consider an appropriate spend down. So that money basically for the sale of that home is what she was supposed to spend down in order to get under two thousand um, dollars to to be approved. Okay, so basically she has uh, she has too many assets at this that point for correct. Medicaid to 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 approve her. That's correct. Okay, and that has basically been the problem for the last couple of years. That is correct. Okay. And when you get in a situation like this, uh, what? What did you do to try and remedy uh, this situation? Yes. So we we had spoken to try to see one, would he be able, would she be able to discharge um, to go home since 
we then realized that, you know what, the home hasn't sold and we could at least try to, you know, it's unfortunate, try to write this off until things got figured out um, so that we would not continue to accrue such a bill. We then realized, unfortunately, it would not be a safe discharge. And so we could not, uh, we could not send her home. So we tried to work with Mr. Camplin and we had worked um, worked diligently with an attorney um, since I want to say probably November, December to try to get the home to be able to kind of get things figured out so that we could hopefully get the home sold so that we could have a lien on the home, get it sold. And then we could at least be able to pay for her stay, get her approved for Medicaid and continue her stay there um, without the issue of her um, her overgrown account. OK. And in situations like these, um, are you required to report to DCF? Or... Absolutely. OK. Yeah. So you when all of this is going on, uh, you are also reporting the issue to DCF. Yes. Once it became apparent that. That there seemed to be a misuse of her her property and funds and that he had no intention or demonstrated no intention to follow through on the sale of that home to, to pay, uh, to actually get her approved for Medicaid. We then um, called DCF, you know, called APS services. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I don't think I have any further questions for you, but Mr. Watts may have some follow-up. Okay. Absolutely. Mr. Watts, questions for this witness? Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, um, Ms. Morton entered in September of 2020, if I understood your testimony correctly earlier, correct? That is correct. Okay. At that time in September of 2020, was she cognizant and aware and capable of making decisions? I can confirm um, here in a moment, I can pull specifically that that day of of entry to see what her score was to see if she should have been able to make that decision. At that time, our based off of what we call a BIM score, um, she was shown to be um, during on that date in two thousand of June and June tenth of two thousand. Um, Actually, let me go back because you asked for 2020. I cannot specifically state due to the um, this specific electronic record is only going back um, on her score to 2022. Okay. So you don't know what her condition was in September of 2020 when she first entered the facility? Well, I do have her medical diagnosis, which would, um, the specific BIM score, but she did still in 2020 have, uh, she still had the diagnosis of uh, delusional disorders. Schizoaffective disorder. All right. Let me ask you this. Delirium. What's a, What's a BIM score? So the BIM score is kind of just a, an assess a, an assessment that's done in the nursing homes to just see if someone is co um, cognitively intact somewhat cognitive attack, severely cognitive, cognitively, um, actually severely um, unable to basically make decisions where they can't follow a train of thought or remember okay. anything. I assume BIM is an acronym for something. You get that for you. And so she, so when, when there was a score done, um, an eight to 12 would suggest moderate cognitive impairment. Okay. And I presume, uh, kind of like an LSIR or, or the similar things we use here, that a BIM score, that, that interview has a standardized series of questions. That, that is would correct. Be asked. 
And based on those answers, would be placed in some sort of a scoring matrix. That's correct. Okay. Now, you indicated she was admitted in September of 2020. At some point, she left from the facility. Do you know when that was? Because you said she was back March 8th of 2022. Let me go into her notes, and I can pull that. Please. I'm just continuing to scroll through to see, but it is looking as though, but I'll confirm in a moment that she had, it would seem that she actually had just a hospital stay, but I'll, I'm going to confirm that because I'm all the way through into 2021, from 2020 to 21, and now I'm into 22, and I'm looking at all of her notes. Yeah, so she had a hospital stay. Okay, so she went out. Approximately when? She had went out on February 15th of 2022. Okay. And then she came back March 8th of that same year. That is correct. The previous testimony. That's when she then returned from the hospital. And that's hospital in between. You know that's which correct. hospital off the top of your head or the, the, the notes show? I can Let me go into it and see if I can... Um, I wouldn't be able to pull that specifically from this report. Okay. When she came back in March of 2022, I presume, by the way, this BIM score, I presume this is something that's done on a regular basis? That's correct. Okay. Do they give us BIM score, uh, this uh, interview for mental status, is that done daily? Is it done... Once a week is done when they have to make some sort of decision. How's that done? Generally quarterly. Okay. Or if there's a if there's a significant change, change of condition. Okay. So she comes back March of 2022. What is her diagnosis and condition at that time? Yeah. She was treated for COVID. Uh And, and she also had a BIMS of nine. And then I can go to her, let me go to her medical diagnosis to see what was, was there at that point. And so on, 22 unspecified um she had added to her diagnosis muscle weakness generalized unspecified lack of coordination uh, acute upper respiratory infection this is after she came back from the hospital she diagnosed with the that muscle weakness uh, lack of coordination, upper respiratory infection. That's correct. Okay. Sound like the hospital didn't work out so well. Well, from from what it shows, no, it um, it, it did not. Okay. There was a change. There was a change from when she left. Now you mentioned the BIM of nine. That's a matrix between what one and what. It would be one one in fifteen. Okay. So a BIM score of nine on a one to fifteen scale means what exactly? Um, mild. It would show. Um, so it would suggest moderate cognitive impairment. Okay. Now I have to ask. What exactly does moderate cognitive impairment mean? And by that, I mean in terms of the ability to make important uh, medical, legal life decisions. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yes. So if someone were to, uh, were to score there, we would then 
we would it would really depend on kind of diagnoses and, and their ability to generally make decisions as to how are they actually managing their what we'd call independent ADLs or activity daily living. Would someone be showing signs of, you know, um, would they be showing signs or demonstrating the inability to be able to manage their everyday affairs? Mm -hmm. it, it would suggest that someone in that range may may have difficulty uh, with, with being able to manage those things. Okay. The reason I ask that, you probably know where this is going. In May of 2022, May 14, particularly of 2022, she signs or draws a line on, a, a squiggle, a mark, on a general power of attorney that's been previously admitted as state's exhibit, I think, three. Correct? That is correct. Okay. When she signs that, what's her BIM score that day? Which date is that? That would have been May 14 of 2022. She would have still fallen within that within that nine. Okay. Do you have a record of that or is that just an assumption? No, I have a rec. That was the well, I have the well, she didn't have the BIMs on that specific date. Uh, she had the BIMs on the on the. Let's see, the BIMs. I believe. Let me go to it. So I have the BIMs down on June tenth. So, almost a month later, she has a BIM of what? On that tenth, she has a BIMs of the of the nine. Okay, so how is she doing on May 14th? On May 14th, I, I have no, I do not have record as to what her BIMS would, would be on that specific yeah. day. And um, actually, if you could, this actually might help be helpful. Uh, which specific date are you asking for again? Well, it's, it's the day she signed the power of attorney, which is May 14th of 2022, according to the document itself. Yeah. So I have to see if she's actually in the hospital at that time. So let me confirm that. Well, she said she was back on March 8th of 2022 from the hospital, correct? One moment. I can... That is correct. Um, I, um, I have actually on... Yeah, the earliest I have it is for three fifteen of that of that BIMS. Okay, so she got back from the hospital on March eighth. You did a BIM score on three fifteen, March fifteenth, which yep. you would have been about a nine. Yes. Um, and then you did another one June ten. You said they do these about quarterly, correct? That's correct. Okay. Do uh cognitive abilities and these sorts of functions fluctuate from day to day some days better than others that can depend depend on the resident um that can that can yes it can fluctuate okay so long and the short of it we have no idea what her mental status was on may 14 of 2022 do we at the specific time of that signing no Okay. Now, um, I understand and part of the documents we were admitted earlier was basically an assistance for Medicare. And just so I'm clear, um, person goes on Medicare generally when they're 65 or older, correct? Medicaid. Medicaid, excuse me. Okay, is that right? Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. I'm starting with, with a few caveats in between. I, I'm rapidly approaching that, so I better okay. figure it out. Okay. Um, so per Medicaid, person would have basically Medicaid is a government supplied insurance or a government provided insurance, correct? You could say that. 
Okay, government provided benefit, maybe is a better that's way. To put that's it. correct. Okay. And part of the regulations for Medicaid is before they're going to pay um, significant hospital stays, medical or medical care, rest home, uh, assisted care living type of things, that essentially a person has to exhaust their personal assets. That is correct. Kind of for obvious reasons that if, if a person has significant personal assets, the taxpayers shouldn't be picking up that bill. Fair? That is fair. Okay. Um, now, in this case, what was her particular asset? Excuse me? What was the asset that was preventing her from uh, getting Medicaid assistance? The sale of her home. Okay. So in order, basically, in order to get Medicaid assistance, if I understand correctly, she would have to sell the home and use those proceeds to defray medical costs before uh, Medicaid would begin to pick up medical expenses. Would that be fair? That is. Okay. Now, in, this would have been in, get a date here. You mentioned earlier that as of now, she had a balance of $143,236.74 as of today, correct? That sounds accurate. Okay. Well, that was your previous testimony, so I hope so, if I wrote it down correctly. Um, as of right now, does she still have that home as an asset? From the, we know that home to have been sold. Okay by Mr. Camplin. Okay. So the cash would be the asset. Okay. The proceeds of the sale. That's correct. Would be the asset. Okay. When you have an outstanding bill like this, 143,000 and someone has assets like that, what do you do? Do you put, do you make some sort of claim on the assets? We do, yeah, and we made that attempt. Unfortunately, we were late. So you attempted to place a lien on the assets, but it was sold before the lien could be placed? That is correct. Okay. We were unaware that Mr. Camplin intended to sell the home without informing us. Okay. We also were unaware that Mr. Camplin had the actual uh, financial power of attorney document, and we only obtained that after the sale of the home. Had we known he had the financial power of attorney document, we would have taken course with action much sooner. We okay. were unaware which, of that until the sale. Let me ask you then, which financial power of attorney document are you speaking of? The one he utilized to to purchase to be able to sell that home. Okay. Had you known of that financial power of attorney document, um, would you made that bill against Mr. Camplin? Immediately, we would have okay. called APS the very month that he, the 30 days after he missed his first bill, we yeah. would have called APS for misuse of funds. Here's what I guess I'm trying to figure out. You testified previously on direct that Ms. Morton was not coherently verbal since at the very least September of 2021, correct? From, I've, from the diagnosis we have here and the time that I've been there, I was there um, last year, and from the, com the communications I've had personally, she is not able to follow nor track a conversation appropriately nor make a decision. And that's been true since September of 2021. 
that's been true since I've been since I've since I've been there as of last year, August of last year, that I can speak to personally. Well, the reason I ask that is because if I wrote down your direct testimony correctly, you testified on direct just prior to admitting uh, Exhibit One, which is this uh, request to get Medicare assistance. That you testified that she had not been coherently verbal since September of since, 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 excuse me, September twenty one of twenty twenty. I'm certain I've read you her medical diagnosis. Okay. Okay. Here's what I'm trying to figure out. If she is not coherently verbal and has not been so since September of 2020, how does she do a power of attorney in May of 2022? Mr. Watts, why this line of questioning? What difference does it make regarding the probable cause whether a felony crime was committed in this case? Well, Judge, the lot of, bottom line is is whether or not my client is on the hook for that uh, hundred and well, the charging document says, <coughs> excuse me, a hundred thousand dollar plus bill, and it appears that the the state's uh, theory is that because the power of attorney is made by Ms. Morton in on May 14 of 2022, that that power of attorney makes Mr. Camplin responsible for that bill because she assigned him the power of attorney on that date. The question becomes, as I sit here and look at it, does she have any ability to make that decision in May of 2022 to assign him that duty? And Your Honor, I think that might only be relevant in regards to the in the alternative charge of the count. Um, but I guess uh, counsel uh, is riding a fine line there when a defendant used it to sell a house, but now they don't want to have it admitted for purposes of bill. Yeah, the validity of the power of attorney document really is not at issue here, is it? Uh, it's it's signed and witnessed. Oh, I was actually, ask, actually asking Mr. Watts. Well, I think it's an issue if the state is is basing Mr. Uh, Campbell's responsibility for the debt based on that assignment of power of attorney. But Mr. Watts, if he if he used it with the understanding that it was valid, and uh, a third party also acted with the understanding that it was valid, what difference does it make? We're not here to determine its original validity, but rather if a power of attorney was misused. Now, if it's the exhibit that the state presented, it would at least be facially valid. People would tend to rely upon it. Um, and certainly, Mr. Kaplan, your client apparently relied upon it. So uh, I, I think this whole line of questioning is really irrelevant for purposes of today's proceeding. You'll need to move into a different direction, Mr. Watts. Understood, Your Honor. Thank you. Nothing else. Any follow-up questioning for this witness, Ms. Norris? Um, just real quick, Mr. Johnson. Um, how did you become aware of the, the DPOA that is entered as Exhibit uh, 3 in this case? Yes. We were made aware of that one from the from the organization or the the person of whom purchased who he purchased the home or who who he sold the home to. They had provided that copy to us. Oh, okay, so and that would have been in what uh, in sometime in twenty twenty four. That's correct. Okay. Uh, thank you. Court has an additional question for the witness. Uh, Mr. Johnson, is Life Care Center, a Life Care Center of Andover, an adult care home? Yes. All right. Any further uh, need for follow-up questioning from you, Mr. Watts? No, Your Honor. All right. Any reason why Mr. Johnson can't be released as a witness at this time? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Watts? I trust not. Therefore, Mr. Johnson, you can stay with the meeting 
If you do, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself or you can leave. Thank you. State may call their next witness. Your Honor, the state calls uh, Tammy Fountain with DCF. Okay, she can be brought in. All right, uh, Ms. Fountain, if you raise your right hand, I'll administer an oath to you. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Your Honor, I need to read a statement um, to allow me to open records. Well, you may do so at this time, Ms. Fountain. Okay. The information that you seek is both privileged and confidential, and I'm not allowed to reveal this information unless the court orders me to do so. All right, Ms. Norris, what type of information is being sought here from this witness? Uh, Your Honor, she is an investigator for DCF, so um, uh, quite a lot of personal information uh, regarding Ms. Uh, Morton. Finds it necessary to these proceedings. Ms. Fountain, I'm going to order you to answer the questions which are propounded to you by the lawyers in this case. Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Ms. Norris? Please state your name and occupation for the record. Uh, my name is Tammy Fountain. I work for the Department of Children and for Children and Families. I'm with Adult Protective Services. I've been doing this since July 2012. And are you familiar with um, uh, Melissa Morton's uh, case? Yes, I am. And how did you uh, become involved with uh, Ms. Morton's case? Uh, we first received the intake on uh, December 18th of 2023 uh, for financial exploitation. And at that time, we went ahead and conducted an investigation and investigation was opened at that time. Um, the financial uh, exploitation case related that um, Melissa Morton's uh, Medicaid was denied due to her owning a home and uh, the alleged perp was William Camplin and he wouldn't move out of her house and he said he wanted to marry her so he wouldn't have to move out of her house. Um, Melissa Morton was in a nursing home at that time and had been what the report said since September of 2020. She appeared not to have capacity. Excuse me, gotta take a drink just a minute. She appeared not to have capacity to give consent to for her finances or attend to her finances. Um, but William Kaplan had um, taken on that responsibility. He had signed documentation with the nursing facility to take on the responsibility. And it was witnessed at the time to take on the responsibility of paying for her obligation there at the nursing facility. Um, we learned that the obligation was $95,166, um, and the bill had not been paid. Um, we also learned that the house was sold on January 5th, 2024, and the money did go into account. It was approximately $170,000. Um, we also... Uh, learned that money was coming out of the account in January, February, March, um, and that it was a significant amount. Um, January was 16,550, February was 10,000, and March was 10,000. Um, we do not know exactly what William, or excuse me, Warren, Camplin was doing with the monies, but we do know it was coming out and it was not being paid for uh, for the obligation for the nursing home. Um, Warren Camplin um, related that he would talk to me about this, but when I when he told me to call him back after 5 p.m., he never was at home. He never answered his phone, so I never was able to talk with him in regards to this. 
Our agency determined this case to be substantiated for financial exploitation, which is unlawful or improper use control or withholding of an adult's property, income, resources, or trust funds by another person or entity in the matter that is not for the profit of or to the advantage of the adult. And we found that to be the case according to KSA 39-1430. So it was substantiated, and um, his name did go on central registry, and it went to law enforcement and the attorney general's office as a substantiated case. The next case we got um, was in um, May 28th, 2024. Um, this case also came in as financial exploitation. And per this report, we had um, that William Camplin was the power of attorney. There was documentation to show that he was power of attorney, that he had sold her house, Hi. Melissa Morton's house, and he was using those proceeds for his own personal use. He was currently renting her home from the new buyer and was residing in the home and he was working with the buyer to purchase his own home with her proceeds. Uh, approximately $60,000 had, be, had been spent of her proceeds at the time of this report, which is 528 of 24. The home, again, was sold for $170,000, and she was in a nursing home, um, could not make her own decisions, um, and able to do that. Um, she also was a quadriplegic, and uh, so she could not get out of the bed. Um, she had signed with him a power of attorney to take care of her financial affairs and, and information. Um, so he had that obligation and that responsibility to, to pay for her obligation, which was still that outstanding balance of over $95,000. Um, we did, was able to get the bank records and we learned um, from the bank records that shortly after the money was put into her account, 170000 that money of withdrawals started coming out. Like I said, 16550 in January, 10000 in February, 10000 in March. And then in May, there was a total of $12,000 that came out of the account. Um, when the case was open at this time, the bank was contacted to please put a freeze on the account. And before the freeze could be put on the account, another I was informed that another 40,000 came out of the bank account. Um, also, we contacted law enforcement to find out um, kind of what they were doing and if they were pursuing anything. And they did pursue uh, this case and uh, contact was made with the county attorney's office and the victim advocacy program um, for fraudulent activity. And then also the attorney general's office was again contacted. Um, on this case, we also have substantiated for financial exploitation. Um, and his name will be, well, it's the appeals period hasn't quite run out yet, but his name probably will be going on central registry again. And central registry is a registry that prohibits someone from working with adults and disabled persons. And it's through the uh, central office in Topeka. And Ms. Fountain, uh, where, uh, what are the, what's the kind of the details on Ms. Morton? Like, um, you know, her, uh, you've already kind of talked about a little bit of her health concerns, her uh, date of birth, uh, where her house was located uh, that you've been referencing? Yes, her date of birth is 9-11-1959. Um, she had a stroke, is my understanding of why she is in the nursing home in a quadriplegic and is unable. She, she um, parrots, um, she's not able to communicate on her own. Um, and she doesn't have the capacity to make her own decisions. That's been determined. Um, the house uh, that she owned, I have to look at my documents here, just a sec. 
the deed shows that in um, our letters went to the address at. Wait a minute, is that the right one? Yes. Um, we had the property address as 9817 Southwest Pine Road in Andover, Kansas. 67002. And that house and Life Care Center, are those both in Andover, Butler County? Yes, they are. And uh, you said you got a second report that came in May. Um, did you have opportunity to visit with the defendant, Mr. Camplin, uh, regarding I think you said that he, he did not appear for the first appointment that you made for him on the first report, um, but were you able to uh, communicate uh, regarding the second report? We attempted contact with Mr. Camplin. Got to refer to my notes again. Um, contact was attempted with Mr. Camplin again, um, also in June, a letter was sent requesting that he uh, make contact with us, um, and no contact was made at that time. Um, however, he did make contact after we sent the letter out of finding um, and he reported um, that he did not um, spend the money, but he didn't stay on the phone long enough to complete that interview. So he did contact your office um, and I guess try yeah. to basically give an explanation and then hung up? Yes, he did. He tried to, to tell me that he didn't do it and he didn't know why he received a letter of finding. And was that uh, for the first report or the second report or? That was on the second report. And you've been mailing everything to this um, 9817 Southwest Pine Road and over the house address this whole time? Yes. And it was your understanding that the defendant was receiving uh, I mean, th that mail did not come back to your office. That is correct. Also, there was phone contact that had been made as well, and uh, we did not receive any answer to phone messages when that messages were left until after we sent that last letter. Okay, so he did eventually make phone contact, but... Um, it was after we already sent him the finding. Okay. That he contacted us. When you were initially contacted um, and the report was made uh, by Andover uh, Care Life Center, uh, did they provide the contact information um, and a name of Mr. Camplin as, as part of what they needed you to look into, or uh, did you find that information on your own in another way? His information was provided to us, yes, on both reports um, by the reporter, uh, and the address was 9817 Southwest Pine Road in Andover, 67002. Phone numbers was also provided to us, which we did call and um, that didn't produce him calling us back uh, in the time allowed for us to be making a determination on the investigation. Uh, like I said, it was only after that second letter went out um, after we had closed our investigation that he called. And that was a letter of finding with our determine with DCF's determination as to what 
the finding was on the case. And once you finished your investigation and got the substantiations, um, what did you do uh, at that point? Um, once we had substantiated our case findings, we sent, we have to, we're obligated to send a letter to the law enforcement um, where the jurisdiction is, and that would have been Andover Police Department. We also sent uh, our report to the Attorney General's office, um, and then after a period of time for appeal, um, which Mr. Camplin did not appeal, um, that uh, appeal period, when it was ended, then he went, his name went on central registry to prevent him from working with elderly or disabled folks. And besides sending a letter, do you also uh, turn over your investigation information to uh, the police department? Yes, on both on both investigations, we actually report to the police department when we get these types of investigations for financial exploitation. Um, when we get the case, and then at the end of the case, with our determination of, of the finding. Um, and in these both of these cases, um, information was sent to Andover Police Department, um, both at the beginning and at the end to let them know that we have a case so they can do their own independent investigation. And so we let them know at the beginning and at the end of each case so that they know uh, what our determination was and what we found. And then at the beginning of the case that we received a case of uh, financial exploitation in this case. As a part of your investigation, you got bank records from Intrust. Is that right? That is correct. And when you went looking into these bank records, um, you noted that money of Significant amounts were coming out kind of per month. You you kind of gave a list. How was that money actually coming out of the of the account? It was with uh, checking withdrawals was made by Mr. Camplin. Um, and it is he was um, his power of attorney on the account. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, um, on the account, he has the owner sign information, Warren William Camplin, power of attorney, address 98. And that is on the bank information. So he withdrew that as power of attorney for Melissa Morton. She was a primary owner and he was a power of attorney on the bank account. Okay, so he was an authorized signer? Yes, he was. And was that an account that had been open for some time or newly opened? If you know, I believe that account was well. Just move on to another question, Council. Yeah, I don't know that I know that for sure. I'm sorry, I'm not finding that in the state bank statements. Okay, thank you. Uh, and and Miss Found, I don't think I have any further questions. Uh, for you at this time, uh, but Mr. Watts may have some follow up. Okay. Okay. Questions for this witness, Mr. Watts? No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Is there any reason why this witness cannot be excused at this time? No, Your Honor. And we would call at this time Lieutenant Scheinert. All right. Ms. Fountain, you can stay with the meeting if you do. Please mute yourself or you can leave the meeting entirely. It's up to you. Okay, Your Honor. Thank you. Can I have just a, a few minutes before we pick up Mr. Shiner? 
For for what purpose, Mr. Watts? Just I, I I got a hearing another hearing starting in nine minutes. All right. That's all. That's all right, Your Honor. All right. Can we bring the witness in? Connor, I'm here, Judge. All right. Raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter now in hearing should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Yes, Your Honor. Let me question the witness, Ms. Norris. Please state your name and occupation for the record. Uh, Michael Shiner, and I'm a lieutenant with the Andover Police Department. And how long have you been in law enforcement? 12 years. And how long with Andover? All 12 years. Okay. And um, as a law enforcement officer, had you had the opportunity to investigate a variety of different crimes? Yes. Um, uh, have you in the past uh, investigated financial crimes? Yes. And are you familiar with the case regarding Melissa Morton? Yes, I am. And and why are you familiar with that case? Uh, it was a case that was assigned to me uh, involving uh, financial exploitation uh, of Melissa Morton, who was in a nursing home at the time. And at what facility? Life Care Center in Andover. Okay, and so that's within in Andover, Butler County? Yes. And uh, were you able to meet with Miss um, Morton? Uh, I think patrol took the initial case and they went over there and told me that she was nonverbal. Uh, there's no way to communicate with her. Okay. And uh, so what did your investigation involve and, and uh you said patrol went to Andover Life Care Center at least initially. Yes. Okay. So what what did what did you do uh, after you received the initial report from patrol? I contacted Tammy Fountain with uh, Adult Protective Services (DCF), um, and she told me that she was doing an investigation on the allegations, and I advised her when she got the bank records and all that to uh, let me know. Okay. And uh, did you at that time have a suspect? Yes. And uh, who was that? And what kind of, you know, workup did you do regarding that? Uh, the suspect's name was Warren Camplin, the third. Um, and I had his address. Uh, Pretty much pulled all the information I could on him, including DO photos, uh, criminal history, address history, telephone number history, all of that. Okay. And uh, did Mr. Camplin uh, visit with you at any time regarding this case? I attempted to call Mr. Camplin, uh, and I could never get an answer on his phone. And from speaking with Tammy, uh, she was having the same issue. She was not able to make contact with him either. Okay. Um, but based on the information and the uh, that you had, uh, you were able to identify Warren Camplin the third. Yes. And do you see the person that you identified as Warren Camplin the third on the screen today? I am at the courthouse on my phone, and I see me and you. Is there a way to? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can slide. Oh, that's him right there uh, in Mr. Watts's office, red shirt with a truck on it. Okay. You're not asked that the, the record reflect that the officer has identified uh, the defendant, Warren Camplin the third. So reflex. And uh, and what did you understand, Mr. Camplin's, the defendant's 
relationship to be to Miss Miss Morton? Uh, a boyfriend and then power of attorney. Okay. And did you have opportunity to look at uh, bank records regarding this investigation? Yes, I did. And uh, was uh, uh, were there concerns when you reviewed the bank records from interest? Yes, it was obvious to me that there is money being withdrawn from the account, and I knew that the the uh, nursing home, the life care center of Andover was not getting payments for Miss Morton's care. And you considered, based on um, your information, uh, Miss Morton to be a dependent adult? Yes. Um, thank you, Lieutenant General. I don't think I have anything further, but Mr. Watts may have some follow-up. Okay. What? No question, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Does the uh, state intend to call further witnesses? No, Your Honor. Does the defense intend to present evidence at this hearing? Not at this hearing, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Court finds from the evidence presented that the felony crime of a mistreatment of a dependent adult has been committed and that the defendant, Warren William Camplin III, committed it. Court does make a finding <clears throat> that the state's evidence supports the mistreatment of a dependent adult or elder person uh, under both alternatives as charged in the charging document in this case. Uh, the first alternative, uh, essentially for a taking um, of financial resources of a dependent adult, and also the alternative for a violation of his fiduciary duties under his power of attorney. So he's bound over on both alternatives on the level five felony in this case. We'll proceed to formal arraignment. Mr. Wass, does your client desire the charging document to be read to him? You need, this, you need that read to you. Your Honor, we have a copy of the information before us. We want the court to read that to you. Well, I, I think I read that already, but I didn't understand what he said by it over. I'll talk about that in a moment. Your Honor, we'd waive formal reading at a not guilty plea at this time. Ask the case be set for appropriate pretrial and jury trial settings. All right. Tuesday, December the 3rd, for jury trial in the case, Mr. Watts, December 3, 9 o'clock. Yes, sir. Is that a pre-trial conference? Your Honor, I'm not sure that I'm actually going to be available. Could we have your January date in lieu of... Trial conflicts or some other reason? I'm sorry, what was the what conflict? What was the reason that you're not going to be available? Was it trial conflicts in another division or? I think I, I, I will be out of the office. Tuesday, January the 7th. I think that uh, interferes with some leave time of Mr. Watts the week before. Is that right, Mr. Watts? Uh, Judge, I should be back by the end of December, first day of January. Okay. At, uh, Thursday, January the 2nd. At 11 o'clock a.m., Mr. Watts? Pre-trial conference? Yes, sir. OK, 
Kaplan, I'm going to order you to either be at the Judicial Center for the pretrial conference or in your attorney's office like you are today. No other locations, all right? Yes. Mr. Kaplan, where are you currently residing? I'm living outside in a camper. All right. You know, well, have to all right. don't play games with me. Where Where I'm are not. you at? Where are you residing? At a lake. At a lake. At a lake. Which any lake? any lake in? Okay, I'm sorry. What what lake? Um, Harvey County. It's just about thirty minutes away from here. So you're living in a camper without an address at a lake. Yes. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, it's a. So it's you have a, no fixed address. East Lake, East Lake, East Lake, Harvey County, something like that. Quite right, frankly, uh, Mr. Camplin, this court's insecure about you not having any type of fixed address. Before, well, I think you were at Cheney Lake, right? And now yeah, you're at a different lake. Well, because I had to sell something because I couldn't get water out of Cheney Lake. The lakes receded receded so much that. Uh, I had to go to a place, back to a place where I could get water because I'm taking care of Melissa's animals and, you know, everything still and uh, trying to keep up with everything. So you have the animals with you at the lake in this camper? They're in now, but they're allowed to be out on a leash. So how do you get your mail? I don't. I, I got, uh, I've been getting mail since uh, June 10th. I got, I had to leave the house, not because I wasn't paying rent, but I just had to leave. And uh, so I left and I, I was at Lake Afton for a long time, but they wouldn't allow the trailer I had for some reason, even though other people had just the same kind of trailer. And so I had to leave Lake Afton. I couldn't go to, I uh, can't remember the name of the lake, but it's out. Well, it's this way from almost when you get to Andrew where there's a lake. But they don't take that kind of a trail either. So I had to search around and the only places that I could find them was up in Cheney. And I still haven't found out about El Dorado yet. But right now I'm more concerned about finding a place for the winter. And I think there's one in Augusta that where you can have a the dirt open year round. And they're a little cheaper too, so that might be something more I can try to manage. Well, I'm not pleased with your transient existence, I'm Mr. Not. Camplin. At least based on the evidence presented today, this court would have reason to believe that you've had access to considerable financial resources, yet you apparently live with animals at various lakes in some sort of camper trailer. The the money it was no, well. No, 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 don't go there. Um, but you do have your own uh, motor vehicle of some kind, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I got you to court today, Mr. Camplin. Yes. I'm not going to take action on your bond right now, but again, I'm not pleased that you don't have any type of fixed address. I've been trying. I think you're under a $35,000 bond with a surety. Not going anywhere. No. No. An OR bond was set in this case? 35000 OR? I believe so, Your Honor. He did appear by summons. Yeah, yeah. Very well. No action will be taken on his bond status at this time. Just remember where you need to be on the date you need to be there, Mr. Yes. Camplin. And the next date in the case is, I believe we set it for, yeah, you. remind me of the time that we set the hearing on the January 2nd council. 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Yes, sir. All right. Will you write that down for your client, Mr. Watts, since I he did, obviously can't get any mail from you? I did, Your Honor. 
And Your Honor, one more thing before we go. Um, just as a matter of of course, we would ask uh, that uh, the defendant be, you know, officially removed um, as the power of attorney for uh, Ms. Morton. And Your Honor, Interest Bank has actually had a courtesy hold for DCF on the account where the money from the that we've been discussing where the proceeds for the house went. We would ask that, um, uh, and the bank has sort of asked for a court order um, to basically not allow Mr. Camplin to have any access to those to those funds. Um, DCF is currently working on a guardianship and conservatorship, but it's not complete yet. Um, and we just want to make it clear that he not be allowed to have any access to any of those things anymore. Mr. Watts? Judge, I don't know that I represent him on any sort of civil matter as terms of power of attorney. I would note at this point he's accused of a crime, not found guilty of one. Furthermore, Ms. Norris, I don't know where my authority would come from to invalidate a power of attorney in a criminal case. However, I can enter orders restricting the activities of the defendant, and I think we can accomplish the goal that I that you're seeking to uh, accomplish here by simply uh, this court entering an order that Mr. Camplin, you are not authorized to use that power of attorney for any purpose, and that any uh, attempt to use it would be a violation of your bond conditions. Do you understand that, Mr. Camplin? Yes. You cannot use it or even attempt to use it for any reason. That is a specific court order restriction upon you at this time. Anything else, Ms. Norris? Your Honor, regarding the bank account, he is an authorized signer of the account, but the, the bank is put on Only through his power of attorney, though, it's my understanding. He's he's otherwise not authorized as a signer, is he? Uh, the The paperwork looks like he's an authorized signer. I'll also put a restriction on Mr. Camplin from using any authority as an authorized signer for any account in which Melissa Ann Morton has any interest. Uh, he is uh, precluded from being able to uh, use his status as an authorized signer to access any funds or transact any business on that account. That's going to need to be drawn up into a separate order, Ms. Norris. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you for doing so. All right, Mr. Watts, anything further at this time? No, Your Honor. You have any questions about what we've done here today, Mr. Camplin? No, Your Honor. All right. But if there's nothing further at this time, the Camplin matter will be in recess, and this meeting may be ended. For